Hi, it's Connor Svensson here, founder and CEO of Web3 Labs. This is a conversation I had with Yanis Smeradakis, co-founder of DDoB. Yanis is a researcher specializing in programming languages and software engineering and an entrepreneur. Off the back of his work researching smart contract vulnerabilities, he co-founded DDoB. DDoB is a leader in smart contract security, providing tooling for vulnerability analysis of smart contracts and auditing services. In our discussion, we unpack why Ethereum was so fascinating to him as a program analysis researcher, the many different attack vectors for Web3 applications that exist, the challenges associated with smart contract auditing, which his firm does a lot of, and why Web3 attracts the best programmers. It was fantastic to learn from such a knowledgeable expert and get a real insight into his world. And I'm sure off the back of this, you'll never look at smart contracts or Web3 in quite the same light again. Yanis, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here today on the podcast. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in learning about how you first got interested in Web3 and how from from there it, it, it became something that was more than just like a passing interest and became in a significant part of what you're doing day in day out so actually for me that uh, the interest came mostly from uh, from the technical uh, standpoint from a technical standpoint i've been uh, my entire life i've been a researcher of uh, program analysis i write algorithms that understand programs uh, and uh, this has been a fascinating area of application of program analysis because we have smart contracts and they handle large sums of money. So it's, uh, they, they are particularly uh, correctness critical. So this is an area where it's actually highly promising for applying the kinds of techniques that I've been interested in. And uh, sometime, I don't know, five, six years ago, one of my colleagues, a cryptographer, first introduced me to Ethereum and uh, Back then, uh, I heard for the first time about the DAO hack and, and all that, and it sounded just so extremely cool. I mean, having read the, uh, the Bitcoin uh, white paper, the Satoshi paper, that was fascinating. I think for most technical people, this is, this is fascinating. And uh, at that point, seeing how this can be used as a computing platform, uh, this was uh, just eye-opening for me. And to see that there are correctness needs in that space and there are analysis needs in that space, that was great. And, uh, you know, if I, if I can go a bit more on that, uh, I have started a couple of companies that, are, uh, that build on program analysis technology. And program analysis is something that sounds pretty obscure and esoteric, like you have programs that try to understand programs. And in fact, uh, for many uh, for many of the commercial aspects of what I've been trying to do, uh, getting traction was really hard. I had tried to launch a company that does analysis of cell phone apps, for instance, or Java desktop and enterprise apps in, uh, in the past few years. Uh, but there were many, many technical difficulties in all that because uh, the code for the programs to analyze was not, was not readily available. I mean, we could go to GitHub, but then we would have to build the programs in order to apply algorithms on that. And now I had this gift from the heavens on the blockchain. I have a, a setting where all the programs that matter are out there. Everyone is publishing them. So they're there for me to analyze. And most of them have source code available. And all of them have all of their past executions available. I don't even need to run test cases or to invent test cases. I can go and see what the programs did in the past. That's what's happening with smart contracts. And I can go and see what's their current state, like what's in their memory, because it's their storage contents are reflected on the blockchain. So I have this wealth of information about interesting programs that should be correct. Uh, so that was a gift for me as a program analysis researcher. So if you disregard anything that has to do with crypto valuation and actual money and prices, et cetera, just from a technical standpoint, it was extremely interesting and extremely promising that I could go in and do cool things with smart contracts. So that's really what got me 
into the space. And I can talk about the, the introduction and how I got into the space and like the technology we, we started to introduce slowly, but roughly, I think the big picture is you have interesting programs, they need to be correct, and they're right there for analyzing. So that's, that's a gift. Yeah, ab absolutely. And uh, I think one of the things I really enjoy always about talking with so many folk in the space is just how many of them were drawn in because of the computational nature of Ethereum and, you know, rather rather than the, you know, with, with Bitcoin, a lot of the time it was the, the financial aspect. But I think, you know, this, this programmability, the computational part of Ethereum, um, it's just such a fascinating part of it. So that's certainly what pulled me in originally as well. Um, so, so kind of um, expanding on that. So you started to, um, you know, work, work, well, see this amazing open data set that was available for this world computer. Uh, and did, did you have, did you start transitioning your research to kind of focus more on that or how, how did it shift? I know you've, you've created a company off, off the back of it as well, which we'll talk about, but uh, yeah, how, how did it go from this kind of interest to being more or, you know, all consuming and how, how were you able to make more of a transition there? Yeah, it, it's exactly like that. I, I started transitioning my research, uh, started finding interesting research topics that had to do with smart contract analysis, with uh, analysis on Ethereum. Uh, so back in 2018, we had uh, we had a paper that uh, won a couple of awards. It, it's, uh, it's been published in like the top scientific magazine of uh, of the ACM, the Computing Association, as a technical highlight. But it won originally awards at the conference where it appeared. And this was specifically on analyzing for gas related vulnerabilities. And around the same time, this, this was all work with uh, Neville Gregg, who was back then my postdoc. He's now my co-founder at DDOB, a close partner in everything I do technically and uh, business wise. Uh, so Neville was, was working on the analysis. And at the same time, we started working on a decompiler. Uh, so we were not happy with the technology substrate for our analysis. Uh, and we started developing our own tools for taking the bytecode that's deployed on chain, on the blockchain, and reversing it into a form that analysis can run over uh, so we can actually detect vulnerabilities. So that's, uh, that was the GigaHorse decompiler. And we've been operating it uh, as a public service non-stop since uh, September of 2018, so close to four years now, uh, and that's on contract-library.com, contractlibrary.com, or library.ddob.com. Uh, you can also find it from ddob.com. Our uh, company page is one of our products. It's a, it's a free service. Uh, we have about 100 users per day. They're all security analysts, so they're kind of the most, some of the most technical people in the space, like in the security forums, uh, it's uh, often mentioned as a tool uh, that people use, especially for, uh, for bots, for attack contracts, for anything that will not have source code published with it. Uh, people come to our site to see what it may be doing, what's its current state and what the code may be doing. Uh, so, so we've had this service and the service gave us some publicity and eventually the publicity gave us consulting opportunities and consulting opportunities turned into some seed capital that let us launch a, a proper full-fledged business, which is really DDoP. So it was a slow evolution for the past several years uh, towards a successful business, which is uh, DDoP. So, so, so with DDoP, there's kind of two two components to it, from what I understand. You have this contract library, and then you have the watchdog, right? And so, with the contract library, say many people they'll work with, for instance, EtherScan. Say if they want to see details of smart contracts and the, the source code associated with them, what sort of information do you provide there that's different, that's more kind of relevant to security researchers? I know that EtherScan is more about just the events, how it affects tokens, and um, you know, contract source code, these sorts of things. But what what are kind of the, the differentiators there that are important for security's sake? Yes, yeah, so the, the number one differentiator is that we have a better decompiler for contracts that don't have source code available. 
so you can actually see contracts uh, as they as you would reverse engineer them from bytecode form. So that's a that's a big differentiator right there. And then we offer uh, some more information on on several different aspects. Like for instance, we offer a low level storage dump. Everything that's stored on chain about in the storage of this contract. Uh, you can see it in raw form, or you can go and explore location by location what's in storage, what's in the mappings, what's in the arrays. Uh, you, we also have uh, allowances. We have a much more detailed view of allowances than uh, what Etherscan offers right now. For every address, not just contracts, but also EOAs, you can see uh, who they have approved. Also, if it's a contract, who has approved that contract? Uh, that two-sided information is not something that you can get out of an Etherscan. You cannot just go and say uh, who has approved that contract, although you can go and say uh, which contracts this address has approved. So these three things are the main differentiators why people would come to Contract Library. At the same time, probably in terms of a code browser, we probably have better code browsing experience, uh, better search, better linking, Etc. But you know that's that may be kind of subjective. But I think the top three differentiators is if you want to see uh, decompiled code from low level, if you want to see detailed storage contents, and if you want to see allowances uh, in detail as a full list uh, and both ways, both who you have allowed and who has allowed you to spend their money. Okay, and so then also to complement this, you have Watchdog. And when, when I was having a look at it, it struck me as, it, it, is it fair to say it's kind of like a virus scanner for smart contracts in terms of it scanning all this activity that's happening, trying to highlight security vulnerabilities, you know, and it's a constantly evolving target that you have to work with there. Yes, that's exactly the case. I mean, so it's a high level analogy, right? Because virus scanners really uh, leverage different kinds of patterns. But at a high level, that's exactly what it is. It's like a virus scanner for smart contracts. It's not, not so much virus or as vulnerability scanner for smart contracts. So it's trying to find if there are ways uh, that contracts can be attacked. And we have currently something between 70 and 80 different uh, vulnerabilities that uh, we have written static and dynamic analysis for. So we have written algorithms that specifically look for these kinds of vulnerabilities. And they, uh, we scan the contract code, try to find if we think the vulnerability is there. And Watchdog consists of taking this and escalating to a human auditor, someone who has experience with auditing lots of contracts, lots of code, uh, in a manual way, and the auditor who is uh, committed to a monitored project will actually look at all those warnings every week, every couple of weeks, depending on the levels uh, of service that we have for that particular client. And the auditor will look at the reports and say, hey, this, this is, looks highly suspicious. I better spend a few hours and see if this is really vulnerable. And if it is, it gets escalated to the project owners, meaning the development team or whoever is the security team for the project. So yes, Watchdog is kind of a hybrid, uh, definitely algorithm assisted, but not entirely automatic. It has a human component. It's a continuous monitoring system, continuous auditing system for deployed smart contracts. Okay, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's great to see this sort of infrastructure there. Um, and with regards to kind of your your vision of what you're trying to achieve with the different components, I can see how you can you know with with these you can make sense of some of the more anonymous contracts on online. You can get notifications of different vulnerabilities. Are there are there other areas that are really key to you which you haven't actually um, incorporated yet? Kind of into this, whether it's one of these existing products or additional products that you feel are very important for the security size. Where I am here, I can see that there's two very clear things that uh, the contract library does uh, around contract library providing 
insights and you know, understanding of what's happening with respect to these different smart contracts and the inner workings of them. And then you have the watchdog, which is your alerting type service for these vulnerabilities that contracts might be exposed to. And then uh, is there anything kind of missing from that in terms of from a security perspective? Would you feel that that's kind of, you know, having these things are really the, the, the key pieces of the puzzle? Well, we think these are some of the most uh, promising areas for addressing vulnerabilities. Uh, we also do a lot of manual auditing. I mean, we have uh, uh, multiple audits running at any single time. So I think auditing in this space is well recognized as a, as a high need for security. And certainly there, uh, there are some very good auditing companies. Auditing has unique advantages in having experts in both the code and the kind of protocol vulnerabilities, uh, having those experts look at your code. So we don't, uh, we, we certainly would not downplay that. There's certainly aspects of the space that we are not ourselves covering. These include most of the dynamic monitoring, like we are not ourselves uh, doing anything to monitor, say, accounts that get funded from Tornado Cash, let's say, and seeing what protocols they interact with. We do talk to people who do that. We, get, we do get their alerts many times. Uh, we do participate very actively in the white hat hacking community and try to prevent vulnerabilities. Uh, so definitely we're active in this space. We are not experts. Uh, we're not targeting this space ourselves with a product of our own. Um, Certainly, we don't do UI or penetration testing. That's also uh, very important, kind of the non-smart contract side of things, uh, the, the web uh, technologies side of things. It could have very serious vulnerabilities. So that's something else that's, uh, that's an angle that's very important for security that we don't target other companies do. Uh, if a customer wants something like that, we direct them to partners, to people who have worked with uh, in the past and uh, certainly in terms of uh, I don't know kind of the financial side although we do have uh, a finance expert uh, and uh, we do get the top finance advice in all the audits we do we don't offer customers finance advice and obviously this is a big uh, this is a big front that one could call security related although probably not Thankfully, yeah, absolutely. The I mean, the the, the protocols themselves uh, seem to be holding up very well um, with with all of the activity of late, which is a, a, a good thing to see. And so, digging a little bit further into the auditing, because I, I think that the auditing is one of those areas that's fascinating because there is so much at stake on these different networks and. I'd, I'd be interested for you to kind of talk maybe as well to help educate some of the listeners here a bit more on, um, you know, why the auditing part is so important and what are kind of the, the ways in which audits are done, because there's, there's no doubt some parts which are automated, but then there's some other pieces which uh, you can't fully automate around this. Yes. So the auditing has the, the problem with security is that, that it's a very holistic kind of thing you could get major security vulnerabilities out of like a single line of code that has a tiny mistake. Like uh, just a couple of hours ago, we had our company meeting, a weekly company meeting, and everyone is reporting on their audits. And one of the findings in an audit last week was missing a pair of parentheses. Basically that missing of a pair of parentheses can escalate into stealing all the funds of a contract. Now, this, this sounds extremely superficial, but it has extremely serious repercussions. So, and it's very hard to know at what level security can go wrong. Security can go wrong at the very, very low level, the missing of a pair of parentheses. Uh, that's kind of the easy case because that's more automatable even if it's not in practice automated right now because nobody had thought of that, it's more automatable than more protocol level vulnerabilities. And then it can go all the way to complex financial manipulation. It can go all the way to 
well, you call that function at this point, but what if someone has taken loans with these characteristics before calling that function, then suddenly you get a distorted view of what's the price of this asset or what's the value of your collateral or all of that. So you can have things that are extremely nuts and bolts affect security, and you can have things that are entirely finance level concepts affect your security. So for, for this reason, you, you need to rely on human experts that understand everything very well, everything from the code level all the way to the finance level. And that's what makes auditing unique because that's exactly the kind of expertise you appeal to when you go out to audit. You're trying to find people who, who are equally well-versed in nuts and bolts, in the code, and in the finance manipulation. And you don't need just one of these people, you probably need a couple of them and to be challenging each other and to be uh, developing a model and a good understanding and to, uh, to converse over the code and the protocol for a week or a few weeks, uh, depending on the size of the code base. And they come up with extremely different kinds of vulnerabilities or attacks. And that's, I think, the most safety one can get before deploying in this space. Uh, you cannot deploy just based on uh, automated solutions, like the automated solutions will catch one kind of vulnerability, and it could be a very valuable kind of vulnerability, but they will not catch different kinds. And you cannot just rely on people who know the finance or the protocol because there could be extremely low level bugs that somehow lead to the wrong model inside the program and can lead to very, very serious vulnerabilities. So you want someone who can think holistically and I think only a person with very good experience and expertise can do that. And that's exactly what auditing offers. It's this integration across different layers of, layers of abstraction that I cannot see any other way of doing it other than employing someone who will really be thinking about your code uh, for a good chunk of their time. And presumably it's, it's very hard as well for the auditors just to keep up with everything because the space is evolving so quickly. The tools, you know, new releases of the tools are happening fairly regularly. There's new language features being added. And so you know, from the outside, it's, it sounds like it's an insurmountable task, so to speak, to be able to do that. Well, I think um, given how busy auditors have been for the past couple of years, well, the market was booming. Uh, I think that people, whether they wanted it or not, they've kept up with new technologies and new protocols just because, I mean, I was on a panel recently and one of the, my co-panelists said, I've probably audited for 50 weeks straight for the past year. That's, uh, that's kind of extreme, but I'm not very far from that myself. Uh, so the point is uh, auditors have been very, very busy. And even without trying very much to keep up, just trying to be conscientious in following the code they audit, they learn about new technologies and new protocols every week. But it's hard work regardless, even, even though it may not require conscious effort to learn the new things, just because you see them in front of you, you see the new protocol. Hey, I had never seen that protocol before. Let me check its API, make sure that uh, the code I'm auditing is calling it correctly. It's making the right kinds of assumptions. So yes, there is a lot of learning in this, but uh, it's not so much reading in your free time. It's kind of once someone is at a good level, they inevitably will learn new technologies on the job just because everyone is using the same kinds of uh, big name protocols and the same kinds of tools. And, and, and presumably as well, there's there's a degree of um, well, there's a fairly high degree of reuse of code, um, you know, at, at a level anyway for certain types of use cases. Uh, there's there's pretty high reuse of code, not as high as one might think. I mean, there are thousands of lines of original code in almost every protocol uh, we audit. I mean, there are there are well-known clones 
of entire code bases, and those typically don't even get audited very much. Uh, I mean, the, someone who launches a clone may not have the budget to do a full audit, uh, but there's a lot of new code that's getting developed. Uh, so although there's reuse of libraries, and obviously there are libraries like Open Zeppelin that uh, different incarnations of those everyone will use in why, one way or another, uh, but much of the functionality is not reusable blocks. It's original functionality uh, that people develop uh, in a custom way for their new protocols. Uh, you know, maybe I'm biased because obviously the code that someone will ask us to audit is, is new code most of the time. That's why they ask us to audit things. But uh, I do see a lot more new code than one might uh, expect. If one thinks that it's just putting together blocks in different ways, not really. There's, there's a lot of original code. Uh, and that's what really we audit most of the time. What, what do you think um, could be done to reduce the, the, the overhead of, of, of auditing? Because there's most of the code that exists on, well, really all the code that exists on, say, the Ethereum network was written in Solidity originally. And it's, uh, certainly it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a fairly flexible language and uh, it's not kind of been coming from a, a, it's not come from a more formal place, for instance, in terms of as, as a language. Um, yeah, you know, what, what would be, in an ideal world, what would be the sort of approaches that could reduce the complexities for, for auditors, or even if it was possible, completely remove that, uh, hypothetically speaking, anyway? I, I don't think it would be possible to remove auditing, even with perfect technology, um, even with perfect languages, with perfect systems, perfect tooling. Um, I think if you want high assurance for something that handles large sums of money, you really want to, uh, to consult someone who has high expertise and experience. So I think auditing can never be completely removed. But what could be done um, on the language or technology side? First of all, Solidity is a great language and it is moving forward. Uh, steadily, so it's, good. It's, uh, it's improving all the time. Uh, so there, there is progress being made, but it still remains a fairly low level language. Uh, in a way, it's not like you can design a data schema that's pretty abstract and then map it down to data structures easily. Uh, you have to worry about the nuts and bolts you have to worry about having your byte 32s and uh, putting them as keys in mappings. You have to design everything down to, to the level of how the data are structured in memory. And that certainly hinders reusability, but also hinders uh, understandability for, uh, for auditors. It, it becomes lower level than it could be. Now that's kind of a fundamental choice and perhaps it's not a bad choice because uh, we don't want people to be deploying on a level one uh, blockchain to be deploying extremely complicated programs uh, that are highly abstract. So it's a good balance. But if we were to think of, if you were to do it from scratch and you had no technical constraints whatsoever, you can deploy on the blockchain anything you want of whatever complexity, whatever size. Uh, yeah, there could be a, a much more abstract language, uh, much closer to a language that uh, takes a schema that has to do with the application. You design your data. That's what I want to store. I don't care how it's stored. Uh, that's what I want the transitions to look like. You go from that state to that state when you get this kind of money and it would be amenable to more tooling. I don't think we're close to that. I think we, we will get good approximations of that in the next five, six, seven years, whatever, as technology evolves. I think I don't see things becoming stale. I see a very good evolution path, both inside the Solidity team and in the development community as a whole. I see the development uh, community 
uh, adopting good practices, good libraries, good tooling, and Solidity is evolving. So instead of kind of visualizing the perfect, if I were to design everything from scratch, I feel happy enough that things seem to be moving to a positive direction and hopeful that they will convert to something that looks like the ideal. Uh, and we are still in the very early days, right? So it's remarkable the kind of power we have in our hands, uh, considering how early we are in the process. Did you feel, whilst the, the whole idea of a you know, Ethereum in itself or other you know, blockchain networks being these uh, massively distributed computers is a, you know, a new concept in terms of it being a public utility, so to speak, the kind of rigorousness that goes with regards to smart contracts and the auditing, uh, what, what, what other industries or use cases do you feel it most closely has parallels with? Because I think to kind of expand a little bit more, say you, you have critical systems in industry that do all, all sorts of things from like uh, I don't know, uh, weapons control to uh, power plant control and, and, and so on. But then you also have, say, systems in banking, but of, often a lot of the systems in industries are kind of behind closed doors on their own infrastructure. So there isn't quite the same level of scrutiny or inability to back out changes. And so I'd just be interested to hear your take on, you know, what, what are some of the, are there any close parallels that um, you, know, you consider around this? I think you said it perfectly. I don't think there are any very close parallels exactly because much of the high stakes industry is relying on security by obscurity. It's relying on running their software behind closed doors, not having the whole world scrutinize their software. The closest parallels would be things like code that goes on the space station or code that goes on a shuttle or something, something that you cannot change. That's kind of a small amount of code, like a few kilobytes, uh, a few hundreds of kilobytes at most, but it's, it's it does, it performs a specific uh, purpose. It serves a specific purpose and people can apply formal methods. They do model checking. They do all sorts of uh, advanced uh, software correctness techniques that there's all sorts of techniques they're trying to leverage, like NASA definitely is trying to do uh, something that's very advanced in terms of software techniques in all their code that runs on autonomous vehicles that uh, get outside the planet. So I think that would be a parallel. It's not a close parallel. Obviously, it's not the same kind of an interacting system with various protocols of holding money, etc. But that would be the closest parallel. And it's surprising that that would be the closest parallel. I don't think the closest parallel is in banking software or in software that handles large factories or in software that handles weapons. Actually, I think that if we were to scrutinize that software, we'd find a lot more bugs and a lot shoddier development practices than what you'd find on the blockchain. Uh, the, the kind of the standards for development on Ethereum are extremely high. There are really some elite software teams, uh, both in terms of expertise and in terms of practices, kind of the uh, the processes they follow and. Uh, overall their practices for development, for testing, for design, etc. And I've been very positively impressed. Uh, I mean, considering how hard software development is, I think the kinds of bugs that we see are expected. And in fact, uh, I would say fewer than what one might suspect, uh, given the overall state of software development outside uh, the uh, the smart contracts domain. Yeah, it's could completely agree, and because this, this is something that really bothers me, because there's the from from a technologist perspective, what's happening in Web three is absolutely fascinating, and because there is so much at stake with these public protocols, yet there's kind of a preconception with a lot of. Um, and I've, I've certainly experienced this with hiring, for instance, people don't want to touch Web3 because they think it's all about the, you know, the financial side, crypto and so on and so forth. And, you know, I, I feel that that sort of mindset is so short sighted because there is nothing like 
you know, what's being done right now with respect to how high the stakes are, but also the, the challenges of being having like a green field for development. So I think hearing your response there really kind of articulated that so well around the uh, sort of elite uh, software teams that are working in the space. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a really nice way of putting it. Thank you. I, yeah, I think we're in very much in agreement there. We, we are enthusiastic about the same kinds of things, the same kinds of uh, attitude that we see and the same kinds of promise that we see in the space. So just to jump um, back back into one of your pieces of research you mentioned earlier on, there was, there was a, a paper that you referred to, uh, was it Mad Max surviving out of gas conditions in Ethereum smart contracts uh, that won the Distinguished Paper Award. It's a uh, is it Oopsla? Is that the object orientated programming something? Yeah, the, the acronym has been uh, uh, has been revoked pretty much. Uh, so, the, uh, so I don't I don't think there's an acronym that goes with a conference. But yeah, it's the Oopsla conference. It's one of the top programming languages conferences. And we had that paper back in 2018, uh, and uh, it is static analysis of Ethereum smart contracts specifically. Back then, especially, we're talking about something that was four years ago. So the development practices were a lot different. The community understanding as to how you develop for Ethereum was very different. And there were many deployed contracts that had unbounded loops, for instance, over large segments of storage. And you could very easily turn those contracts against themselves, uh, like insert a few items in a data structure, and you didn't need to insert more than a couple of hundred items, and then make uh, key pieces of the contract no longer work because there wasn't enough gas to iterate over all the storage items that a certain routine, a certain function needed to iterate over. Uh, so that was, the, those were, I mean, that's not the only kind, but that's a major kind of vulnerability that we were detecting uh, back then. And uh, it's, we're still doing that. Uh, there are not many instances where you will find this in deployed code. Certainly developers know a lot more about how to write good security, good Ethereum code nowadays. Uh, but uh, this was a very valuable early analysis that flagged uh, many hundreds of contracts, of deployed contracts for fairly serious denial of service vulnerabilities. And it also gave rise to our entire static analysis infrastructure everything that we've done as a company, uh, DDoB, everything I've done in my research, and it's been some 10 different uh, research papers on analyzing smart contracts that followed this one. Everything has been based on the same technology that we initially developed for Mad Max for the gas vulnerabilities detector back in 2018. Right, All right. so Ma Mad Max was the name of the uh, actual detector that you wrote. Yes, Mad Max is the detector, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and so with, with your research kind of now, it's kind of, it, it continues to focus on similar sort of themes. Is that fair to say? Or are there kind of other areas which it's expanding into as well, which are sort of tied in with the space? Well, you know, we have, uh, we are a company, we're growing. We're, we have, uh, I think, uh, close to 20 people now, if you count, uh, especially if you count interns this summer, but let's say over 15 full, full time. Uh, so we are certainly expanding in various things. We have our security tooling, which is our bread and butter, uh, both the watchdog, uh, the continuous auditing and contract library, our free service. But, uh, but we are expanding in many different directions. We have projects in the works that are infrastructure projects, for instance, we are developing uh, modified clients for monitoring of other EVM-based blockchains, other blockchains that are uh, EVM-based. So we, we just made, uh, we just partnered, had a big deal with uh, the Phantom blockchain. So we're going to be deploying our infrastructure on Phantom. We're also trying to uh, to build protocols and libraries. So we are doing, it's not, uh, it's not public yet, but we are doing Solidity development uh, quite a bit as a company. So. There are multiple interesting smaller projects that uh, we're working on, uh, but really our core business remains automated uh, or automation-assisted security solutions for smart pro contracts. 
uh, we want to secure this space. We want to, to be among the best known good guys in this space. I mean, in the past uh, 15, 16 months, we have disclosed something like nine major vulnerabilities in deployed protocols. Uh, like we've gotten more than 3 million in bot bounties alone. Uh, so we've, we've been pretty central in this space. Uh, we're trying to be white hat hackers. We're trying to offer tooling for, for the good guys. We're trying to collaborate with everyone who's doing monitoring, who's a white hat hacker. Uh, that's the core of our business. And from there, we expand into everything in the space that looks interesting and promising. Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly great to see um, that there, there is um, so much recognition within the space for the, the the white hat work that's done out there. So many industries, I think, are you know, almost slightly dismissive or don't pay enough attention to it. Whereas you can certainly see with uh, the good guys when they disclose these vulnerabilities, it's you know, the, the, the rewards there are good, and so they should be given how much is at stake here. So that's that's really refreshing to hear. Um, so, so let's so moving on. Uh, to one of the things you touched on earlier is that we're still very early in the the, the broader kind of Web three adoption narrative. Uh, how how far along do you think we are? As in, um, you know, we we've certainly seen things like uh, cryptocurrencies, NFTs, uh, you know, kind of cross the the chasm into mainstream adoption. Um, but there's no doubt going to be other things over the coming years. Uh, where, 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 where do you think we are in the overall kind of, you know, Web three adoption journey? Well, if uh, if you go out on the street and you ask a random person what percentage of your uh, of your finance footprint is on the blockchain, what do you think they will say? You ask if you take an average, and I mean, I, I don't know. I think I, are you in London? Uh, yes, I am. Well, so you will get a, an even, you will probably get a biased average. It's going to be higher than if you actually take a random person off the streets of other major cities. But if you ask the, the random citizen of this planet, I think zero would be an, a good enough approximate answer. Maybe if you want more digits, it would be 0.3% or something. I don't know. Uh, but uh, we are pretty far, right? So if this is... If this is a place, if this is a technology that can store value in the most undeniable, unbiasable way and have intelligent agents that autonomously manage money uh, as we would like the entire finance uh, industry to, to do outside the blockchain as well. And if this is the best place to have all that, uh, I mean, it stands to reason that what we expect to see in the next uh, in the next years is moving more and more economic activity on chain. So it's not going to be exotic anymore. Uh, now, what is economic activity? Is NFTs economic activity? Yes, to a great extent, uh, I guess. But I'm not. Uh, but but they also show that what one could consider economic activity has uh, social implications so it has a social projection that people perceive very differently. I have not gotten myself uh, involved in NFTs at all, but the one time or probably the foremost time that a major newspaper has asked to interview me uh, about crypto stuff has been uh, about art turned into NFTs. Not about anything else, not about any of the technology we're building for DeFi or for anything else. Uh, NFTs have captured the public's imagination exactly because of their association with, with art. So how exactly it could influence our lives, I cannot be sure, but I know that the, the room to grow there is just enormous. Uh, there's so much untapped potential. Yeah, absolutely. So, so to put put you on the spot with another question, uh, in ten years from now, what what are some of the ways in which you think Web three technology will manifest itself in our everyday lives? I think it will not. I don't think it will manifest itself. I think it will be there, and we will not even be thinking about it. 
I think it will be so ubiquitous that we don't think about it. It kind of stands to reason that, well, that's the way lots of things run. And why would I, would anyone be spending any mental effort to really think about how their money is, is being like run in terms of the nuts and bolts? It's going to be there. So it's going to manifest in, in a way of people who know how things run will know about it, but uh, it's just going to be there uh, for everything without really being discussed so much is my feeling. Okay, so, so 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 people won't be aware of it because the user experience part and all that clunkiness has been solved. Um, but but what what are some of the areas you think in terms of what, what plumbing will it be used for that is kind of standard? That uh, you know when someone's doing an activity, it's just behind the scenes. It's always using those rails. Anything, banking, investing, anything that will need to. Uh, will need to have an authority to certify something. Uh, if you have a college degree right now, why doesn't your college say, go to that smart contract address, enter our key, which you can find on our page, enter, and then you can say, enter my name and anyone can find my credentials. Uh, everything on your resume could be certifiable independently by different authorities and it could be stored on chain. Anything that requires any kind of signing, uh, certification, any kind of autonomous handling, there's no sense in not having it on chain. We have all the logic on chain, we will have ultra scalable data storage, we will have database ability that will be many orders of magnitude higher than what we have today, where we only have a baseline level one Ethereum network. Uh, if, if we make it a thousand times easier, a thousand times cheaper to store bits, just dumb bits there, uh, lots of information will be stored on chain. So that's kind of inevitable. I mean, Vitalik has talked about that repeatedly. I think that's kind of a, an obvious vision because technologically that's extremely feasible and then you you have on top of that all the automation of smart contracts that can actually implement banking logic trading logic anything that has to do with actual money uh, anything that has to do with the way you handle your everyday expenses uh your your wallet will effectively be backed by the blockchain that's kind of the vision i'm not the best person to be talking about that vision that's not my expertise like i said my background is on um, smart contract analysis so i'm just parroting the things that you will probably hear from other people you, you've interviewed on uh, on your show uh people who are much more on the finance side and the entrepreneurial side uh, but I'm just echoing the things that I think almost everyone will tell you, perhaps in my own words. Uh, but I, I, th I think uh, given how long you've been in the space and how close to it you are as well, in terms of you know, really you are there at that protocol that level, working, looking at all these smart contracts, you're, you're very well placed to see how it's evolving and where we're getting to. So I think uh, your, your opinion is, is, is more valid, uh, rather, I'd say I'd argue than less. Um, so, so yeah, let's just to kind of wrap up. If um, if if people want to, um, you know, follow what you're up to, will, are you active on any specific social media platforms? I know that you have the DDAB website, which um, you, you can point people to. But if you just want to let let people know uh, what are good ways to follow your work and what you're up to. So all our technical work goes up on the DDAB blog, on the DDAB website, and then DDAB on Twitter is the best social account to follow. Uh, on my personal one, I just link to some stories of, on uh, the DDoP Twitter uh, that have to do with crypto, but personally, I don't post that much, but I do post through the DDoP account on, on Twitter. Uh, so that's, uh, that's active and that's probably the best uh, social. So that's DDoP, D-D-A-U-B, uh, name of our company and our Twitter handle. Oh, and does does it have a specific meaning, DDoP, as well? So, well, we set out to create a company 
four years ago, and it was actually Neville's idea. I'll give him entirely the credit for that. Uh, we were saying we want to find something that sounds like a word, but is not really a word. And we had a decompiler in our hands. And he said, let's introduce a new word to the English language. Let's say the same way as you daub, we are the people who de-daub. And uh, that was our, that's our aspiration to introduce the word de-daub as the opposite of daub in the English language. Instead of smearing and making things fuzzier, we want to make things clear uh, when they start a little fuzzy to begin with. That's, that's, that's a great story and uh, it's, it, it's a good word. I like it. So, uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's good. Um, well, Yanis, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you today and, and also really insightful, I think, just to get, to get your perspectives on the, the auditing process and just all of the things that people need to be considering uh, around security and so on and why so many more developers should be considering Web3. Uh, it's, yeah, it, 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 it was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for having me, Connor. It was a pleasure and an honor. And it was also great fun talking to you. Cool. All right. Speak again. Cheers. Take care. Hi, it's Connor Svensson here again. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'm really excited to share with you that I've written a book, The Blockchain Innovator's Handbook, A Leader's Guide to Understanding, Adopting and Succeeding with This Disruptive Technology. I've been wanting to share my learnings about blockchain and Web3 for a number of years with a wider audience, and I'm really excited that I can do this now. This book covers everything from the fundamentals of the technology through to opportunity identification and implementation for your business to ensure that you can be one of the big beneficiaries of the wider transition to Web3 that's taking place now. The book is available in physical as well as digital form. For more information, head to web3labs.com forward slash innovators. 